Bienvenidos a todos al taller sobre publicaciones científicas de la perspectiva del editor, organizado por el Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global, IAI. Mi nombre es Lucia Caldeiro, soy asistente de desarrollo de capacidades en el IAI. Y ahora le vamos a dar la palabra a la doctora Ana Stewart Ibarra, directora de ciencia del IAI. Ana. Thank you, Lucia. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for your patience as we were sorting out some question, issues with interpretation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on scientific publishing from an editor's perspective. At the IAI, we are committed to promoting transdisciplinary science and the enhancement of capacities to improve public awareness and provide information to governments and other stakeholders for the development of public policy relevant to global environmental change based on scientific excellence, international and intersectoral cooperation, and the open exchange of knowledge. We are very excited to partner with PLOS Journals and the National Secretary of Science, Technology, and Innovation of Panama for the event. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jamie Mels, Executive Editor of the newly launched PLOS Climate Journal, joined by colleague Laura Francis, Editorial Research Associate of PLOS, and our moderator, Omar Lopez Alfano of the National Secretary of Science, Technology and Innovation of Panama. And with that, I will pass the floor to my colleague, Omar. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for attending this uh, important webinar. And particularly, I thank the Inter-American uh, Institute for Global Change Research and to bring this um, webinar to the Latin American research community and the opportunity to hear directly from the editorial office of the PLOS um, um, journal system um, to offer us um, their perspective on how they handle um, manuscripts. Um, this event is uh, unique from the point of view that in limited occasions, we have the opportunity to hear from editors um, and to sit sort of in first row um, the editor's perspective of how manuscripts are administered by, by the editor office. Um, so for us researchers and research community, the more we know about this process, I think increases our chances um, to be better prepared for submitting our papers in the future. Be before I pass the stage to Jamie from the PLOS um, Climate uh, Editorial Office, I would like to mention a few considerations that I would like to basically pass into Jamie. Um, and these are considerations that are most likely shared by the audience that uh, is present today. Um, and is. Uh, espérate, 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 estoy haciendo algo. Espérame. Yeah, no. So these are considerations that I'm, sh I'm sure they are shared by our community in Latin America and that are perceived as barriers um, for publication from the Latin American perspective. Um, and, and I hope that Jamie will be able to address this at the end of his presentation. And is that beyond the academic integrity and research originality, um, as these are fundamental for the advancement of science, we would like to hear a little bit about how the editorial policies at PLOS and, and in particular PLOS Climate, address the inclusion um, or greater participation from researchers from Latin America or Spanish speaking communities. Um, but also, and most importantly, how does the editorial policies address greater participation from women in, in research output? Also, and not less important, and this is concerned to most of the funding agency probably at, at, at the Latin American countries, is the issue of access to open access, you know, or better known as the article processing charges and whether PLOS has considered a fee structure that facilitate, you know, participation of, of communities um, with greater limitations um, for funding. So I leave it up to here and uh, I pass it to Jamie um, to, to give us um, his, perspective, his perspective, but also I would like to point out that the session um, um, will be recorded and we will be passing um, the link to the, to the video, to the recording to everybody. And I hope it's of benefit of everybody. And I will be monitoring the question and answer section in the chat. 
So basically, everybody leaves their question in the chat for the end, for the end of the of the presentation of Jamie. And um, maybe because of giving limitation of times, uh, unanswered question will be addressed by email. So without any more delay, I would like to um, pass it on to Jamie from Close Climate and to give us his presentation. Thank you very much, Omar. And uh, thank you everybody for joining today and for your patience as we've got the ball rolling with the call. Um, I will just uh, share my screen now. So if somebody could in a moment give me a nod to confirm that you can see my slides, that would be fantastic. Yes, brilliant. Okay. So yes, uh, thank you again for, for joining today. Um, and I hope over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be able to share some um, useful information with you about some of our editorial processes, um, the things that editors look out for um, as they're reviewing papers, evaluating papers um, to help you maximize your success in the publishing process. So um, I am going to um, Covered various aspects of, of the editorial process today in the workshop. And there are three main topics that we'll cover. The first of those will be how to choose the right journal for you, um, and then how to write your paper, and how to navigate the peer review process. In each section, I'll share some of my own editorial insights into how you can get the most out of your experience of publishing and how to avoid common pitfalls. And then we'll have some time at the end, as Omar indicated, to address questions. So please do share those um, as we go along. And during this presentation, we'll be using Slido um, to introduce a, an interactive element. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with Slido, um, you can use um, the, the number on the slide here, 580408, um, enter that code on slido.com. Um, and then when we arrive at those slides with questions on, you'll be able to um, enter your responses to the questions in either English or Spanish. Um, and we will display those um, on the screen so that we can see people's opinions on, on those questions. Um, so keep an eye out for those um, later on. But I thought I would just briefly tell you a little bit about myself um, and how I came to work as a journal editor. So I started off by taking an undergraduate degree in biological sciences at the University of Oxford here in the UK, uh, before going on to take a PhD in plant sciences at the University of Cambridge. And my doctoral research took me to Trinidad and various other locations in the Southern Caribbean, um, where I studied the adaptations of bromeliad plants and the impact of climate change on species distributions. And by the time I finished my PhD, I had become very interested in open science and science communication more broadly. And I was fortunate to find a position here in Cambridge working for PLOS as an associate editor on the journal PLOS One. And I spent three and a half years working on PLOS One, uh, focusing on the plant science and agriculture sections of the journal before taking on the role of executive editor on PLOS Climate um, when it was launched earlier this year. So what does being a journal editor actually involve? Um, there are various aspects to the role, and I've chosen just a few of them to highlight here. On any given day, as a staff editor, I dip into a range of different tasks, including checking new submissions to the journal, overseeing the peer review process, responding to queries from authors, reviewers and editors, and drawing together content to highlight in special issues or collections. And the role also involves lots of outreach work, including attending conferences, working on engagement projects with the editorial board and external partners, um, and contributing to our social media and blogging programs. And from time to time, we also need to develop new editorial policies for the journal and to keep developing and evaluating the journal's overall strategy to ensure that we're achieving the mission that we have set for ourselves. Okay, so that's a little bit of background um, about myself and uh, how uh, staff editors work. So the next section of, uh, of my presentation is going to focus on sharing some tips about how to maximize your success in, in publishing your own work. And we'll start by thinking about how to go about choosing the right venue for publishing your work. So now we have our first Slido question that we'd like you to respond to. Um, and we'd like to hear what it is that you personally tend to look for or take into consideration when you are choosing a journal. So it could be that you're at a very early stage of your career and haven't yet published any research. So feel free to respond with thoughts on what might attract you to a journal in future. Or if you're more uh, experienced and senior, then you will have had real world experience of this already. So um, please do use the 
the, the link on the slide there um, to start sharing some of your responses to, to the question. And feel free to do it in English or Spanish. And if anything interesting comes up in the answers, then we'll be able to address them in more detail in the uh, question and answer session at the end. Okay. So lots of uh, different aspects coming up here to do with the scope of the journal, um, impact, uh, the nature of the editorial board. Um, okay, timely process, yes, yeah, speed of publication, open access There's a very wide range of, of factors here, which is really interesting to see. And um, a number of these are things that I will I'll come to in more detail um, over the next few slides. So please feel free to continue adding to this. We'll be able to, to capture your responses and uh, look through them in more detail later on. But I'll, I'll continue for now with the presentation, um, because as I say, we'll, we'll go into many of these issues that you're, you're raising in more detail now. So thank you for, for those responses. And um, the first thing that I wanted to think about um, was preprinting. So many of you will be familiar with the idea of preprinting, uh, which can be done in either institutional or regional repositories or subject specific preprint servers like BioArchive, for instance. And these days, many peer reviewed journals are very happy to consider submissions of manuscripts that have already been preprinted. Pre um, but that's not universally true. Um, there are still some journals which um, have decided not to consider work which is preprinted. So you need to be sure to check the journal's policy very carefully before submitting. It's also good to know that journals are increasingly offering integration with preprint service, um, which enables authors to submit their manuscript to the journal and have it simultaneously transferred to a preprint server, or alternatively to have the files of an existing preprint directly transferred to the journal. So for instance, PLOS journals um, offer bi-directional transfers um, with servers such as BioArchive and MedArchive. Okay. The next thing I wanted to discuss was open access and open access publishing. And I'm sure everyone is here, everyone here is familiar with um, the benefits of open access. So I won't say too much about those, um, but I did want to dedicate a few moments um, to recognize the, the very strong tradition of open access that exists across Latin America, where you have a long history of, of bottom up or grassroots open access infrastructure, including journals, repositories, and inter-institutional networks. Um, and the academic community in your part of the world has championed some very powerful concepts, um, such as that of uh, Bibliodiversidad, uh, which encourages regional specificity and co-creative approaches in the exchange of knowledge. And there's a clear sense in Latin America that an ethos of science as a public good should underlie open access models. So overall, uh, this is a very dynamic region for open access, and I think there's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from it. Um, now, when we talk about open access, there are several different types or, or flavors of open access, if you like. So if you're looking at a journal, you really need to check which type of open access it offers and to understand what that means. Publishing in a green open access uh, journal may mean that your article is subject to embargo for a period of time after publication. Um, whereas with gold open access, which is commonly used by many dedicated open access publishers, uh, there will be no embargo, but the authors will likely have to fund an article processing charge or APC, which Omar mentioned. Um, so in diamond open access, there are no APCs to pay uh, because the publisher generally receives funding from alternative sources. And there are also hybrid journals which have open access options, but also publish content accessible only by subscription. So it's useful to, to be aware of these different approaches to open access and how they apply to individual journals. And as I mentioned, gold open access involves uh, involving APCs remains very common, um, including for publishers such as PLOS. Um, but there are many arguments, valid arguments against APCs, both for researchers and for publishers themselves. And there is increasing interest in alternative financial models that eliminate APC payments, eliminate the need for APC payments. So over the uh, past couple of years, PLOS, for instance, has implemented um, several new models, financial models, which involve partnerships between PLOS and institutional libraries that remove the need for authors of manuscripts to pay APCs and can also reduce overall costs for the institution too. So if you're interested in learning more about those and specifically for the global equity financial model that we operate on PLOS Climate, um, please do take a look on our website and you'll be able to find lots of information there. 
there. And I'm also happy to say more about that later, of course. So another important consideration when choosing a journal is language. Most international journals are, of course, English language, um, which has the advantage of maximizing the reach of your research to a global audience. Um, many of you will be comfortable in preparing a manuscript in English, but if you do need additional support with this, some journals are able to offer copy editing assistance or have partnerships with services that can help with that um, through a third party. On the other hand, if your research output needs to reach a very specific regional audience, that could be a reason for choosing to publish in a, a regional, a region specific journal that supports local languages. And it's worth bearing in mind that some journals, even international journals, offer the option Option of hosting translated versions of articles, either the full text or just the abstract, which can increase the accessibility of your work to a more diverse pool of, of audiences. And it may be that you want to select a journal on the basis of specific policies that it has in relation to issues such as inclusivity. Um, which, which again Omar mentioned um, at the beginning. And as an example, one of the biggest issues currently in international research and publishing is what's often termed parachute science, in which researchers from high resource backgrounds travel to lower resource countries and perform research uh, without any local involvement and often no benefit to, um, to the local economy or society. And in the past few weeks, PLOS has actually implemented a new policy um, across all journals, um, which has been specifically designed to tackle this particular issue. Um, and again, you can find more information about this um, in the blog post, which I've linked here. And I should mention at this point that I'll ensure that the slides that I'm sharing today are made available to everybody on the call later on. Um, so you'll be able to, to click through on this link and read more. OK, now. At this point, let's think a little bit about how to avoid so-called predatory journals, of which there are unfortunately many out there. And um, our sister journal, PLOS Computational Biology, publishes a really excellent series of articles called 10 Simple Rules, um, which cover all sorts of scientific and publishing related topics. And they recently published an article entitled 10 Simple Rules for Avoiding Predatory Publishing Scams. I won't go through everything uh, on the slide here because you can, again, look this slide up on the PLOS Computational Biology website. Um, but some of the key warning signs that they highlight include things like low standards of peer review, um, publishing content of dubious quality, um, journal metrics that you can't really verify, and a general lack of information available about the, the journal and its editorial board and structure. So the key message really is that if ever you're unsure about the bona fides of a journal, do ask your librarian for their advice because they will be well placed to, to help you in these matters. Okay, so on this slide, I'm just going to very briefly run through some of the other things to bear in mind when comparing journals. I won't talk through all of these points in a huge amount of detail, um, but you should consider whether the subject matter of your article is going to fall within the journal's scope. Um, that sounds obvious, but um, as an editor, I often see submissions of articles that are way outside of, of my journal scope. Um, you should think about whether the readers of the journal are going to be interested in, in your work and whether, on the other side, they are the people who you really want to reach, um, the audience that you want your research to be communicated to. Should you be looking for a journal that supports specifically interdisciplinary publications, if you've taken an approach that, that bridges the gaps between disciplines? Are there editors on the editorial board who will be well placed to handle your work and to select appropriate reviewers for the right expertise? How exactly does the peer review process actually work at that journal? Um, and are there any specific publishing policies that you need to take into account? Is the journal fast enough for you? Some people um, in the, the last Slido uh, question mentioned journal timings. So you should think about the average time to first decision and publication because that does vary widely between journals. Um, we've mentioned APCs, so you should think about whether you will need to pay an APC and whether that will be affordable. Um, and is the journal or publisher a member of organisations like the Committee on Publication Ethics, COPE, um, which is an international body uh, designed to, to support rigorous ethical standards in publishing? Does the journal subscribe to the Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, um, which you may have heard of, which focuses on alternative metrics for impact rather than um, flawed metrics such as the, the journal impact factor, um, which doesn't really provide very useful insights into the scientific quality of published work? 
And finally, does the journal require sharing of all of the data underlying your results or perhaps even the code that you've used in your analyses? Because again, some journals will have specific policies around these sorts of things. So at this point, you've probably narrowed things down to one or two uh, potential uh, venues for your work. So now you might want to delve in more detail into the publication criteria of the journal. Now, these are the framework that editors use when they make their decisions, and reviewers should also be taking them into account when they make their recommendations. And publication criteria do vary widely between journals, so you should always check them carefully. And in particular, you should assess whether the journal's criteria focus more on scientific rigor and reproducibility, as would be the case for our journal, PLOS Climate, um, or whether they focus on more subjective evaluations of novelty or impact, um, because that will have a strong determination on, on how exactly you write your article and how you pitch it to the editors and to the audience of that journal. Okay, now one thing that many authors seem to forget to check uh, is whether the type of article that they're submitting is one that the journal is actually able to consider. It's a surprisingly common reason for instant rejection of submissions to journals. Uh, for example, many journals don't consider unsolicited narrative reviews, perspectives, or other types of secondary research, um, and will reject these straight away. Um, other journals have specific policies precluding, precluding consideration of things like negative results um, or methods papers. So if you're submitting a manuscript for anything other than a standard research article, um, there may be specific submission guidelines that you need to follow and additional policies that you have to comply with. So make sure you do your due diligence to establish which boxes you need to tick. So. Now we're going to come on to thinking about uh, writing your paper. By this point, you should have all the information you need to choose the right journal. Um, so I'm now going to share some quick tips uh, from an editor's perspective about writing a paper. And uh, before we dive in, I wanted to again test the audience's thoughts on uh, what are the main reasons that an editor might reject a manuscript. So um, please, again, uh, share some of your ideas on Slido and we'll see what everybody thinks um, are the commonest reasons for editorial rejections of journal submissions. Okay, yeah, uh, somebody's mentioned uh, the possibility of the submission being out of scope, which, um, as I said, is, is something that we see very, very frequently. Anecdotally, just today, I have rejected a paper which was out of scope for our journal, so it really does happen. Yeah, I can see a comment there about um, the criterion of originality or novelty. Um, that's something that um, will crop up on, on certain journals specifically. Yeah, so it seems like novelty, scope, inappropriate methods, that's again a very common reason. Yeah, so, so we're picking up on lots of different themes here, um, which is interesting to see. And it'll be fascinating to know which of these you have personal experience of, but I won't ask, I won't ask for that. Okay, so thanks again for, for your responses here. It's really good to, to see the range of, of uh, themes that are emerging there. Um, again, we'll continue to capture these and uh, we'll be able to, to look through them in more detail later on, but I'll move on for now. So uh, the first thing that you need to, to do when you're writing your paper is, is work out exactly what message you're trying to communicate in your article. Because if you don't have a clear take home message, editors are likely to reject your submission pretty quickly uh, because it won't be obvious what contribution it makes to the literature. So take some time to reflect on your results and decide on exactly what it is they show and then build your paper around that core message. And we've already talked a bit about how to go about choosing the journal, but once you've done this, you really should write your paper uh, so that it's geared to the requirements of that specific journal. The readership, policies and criteria of the journal will determine how the paper should be written in order to stand the best chance of success. So do have the journal in mind as you go through the whole process of writing the paper. And um, moving on from that, each journal will then have its own recommendations or requirements for formatting, style and so on. So again, you should read those carefully before you start writing. Otherwise, you may end up having to carry out extensive edits to your manuscript when you thought you'd finished, um, which can be very frustrating. So if you're writing a specialised type of manuscript, such as a systematic review, for example, there may be additional requirements about the information that you need to include or the exact phrasing that you have to use um, in your reporting. So again, check up on that before you write. Now, 
Um, I wanted to share with you some of the key things that a journal editor will be thinking about when deciding whether or not to send your manuscript out for peer review. Um, first off, is the cover letter convincing? Does it provide a succinct explanation of the contribution made by the paper? Has the scientific rationale of the study been clearly explained in the introduction? Um, it's surprising, again, how often that, that isn't uh, very well done. Um, are the methods described in sufficient detail and are they reproducible? Uh, again, many journals have specific requirements around reproducibility, and I personally think all journals need to. Um, are the conclusions that the authors have drawn reasonable on the basis of the results that they're presenting? Um, and the same really for the title of the manuscripts. Um, really, you want to make sure that you're not overblowing your conclusions or extrapolating beyond the scope of your study um, in the conclusions that you draw and the way that you present the paper. So if the answer to any of the questions here is no, uh, then there's a very good chance your manuscript will be rejected um, or perhaps sent back to you by the editor for clarification, which can obviously delay things. Now, I wanted to say something specifically about abstracts uh, because they are very important. Some journals actually base their initial decisions entirely on the abstract, so you need to make sure that yours is strong. And you should write it after you finish writing the main text of the manuscript, because it's only at that point that you'll really be in a position to summarise the argument of the paper. The abstract needs to convey the core message of the paper with key information such that somebody else could read it and understand what your study was and the significance of your findings. So you should check whether the journal that you're submitting to requires a structured abstract with subheadings reflecting the different sections of the manuscript. Um, and that's more common in some fields of research than in others. Another thing to, to consider is that some journals also require graphical abstracts, um, which you might need uh, another person to help with. Okay, now just a few more detailed thoughts and some other common reasons for rejection. And first we'll look at methods and reproducibility. It's very common for editors to reject manuscripts because the methods used in the study weren't appropriate um, or because insufficient detail has been provided to allow for reproducibility. You always need to include enough detail for another scientist in your field to come along and repeat your experiments. That's important for the integrity of the scientific record. You should also be aware that many journals will require you to share data, software or code underlying your results and analyses, both for the purposes of peer review, but also for publication. So make sure you're in a position to share all of that when needed and in the right format. OK, a quick note on research ethics. If your study involved human participants, animals or any protected material or information, it will be subject to an additional level of ethical scrutiny. And editors will be checking for whether you received prospective approval of your study design from a competent authority, such as an institutional ethics committee or review board. Um, and they will reject the manuscript if you've not provided details of those approvals. They'll also reserve the right to reject studies that involve methods that don't conform to internationally recognised standards, even if those are permissible locally. So you have to kind of consider whether your, your study design um, before you even start the work um, is going to be compliant with expectations at an international level um, beyond just what, what might be considered permissible locally. Um, this is something that's relevant to all regions of the world, but um, that everyone needs to be aware of. Okay. A quick note on competing interests and funding. Um, alongside the manuscript files, you'll have to make declarations around these things, so be ready with the information. Editors will be looking for transparency around conflicts of interest, such as patents related to submitted work and commercial affiliations or funding. So be aware that if your work received receive funding from um, specific sources, such as the tobacco industry, for instance, uh, journal policies may lead to automatic rejection. You might need to uh, provide additional clarity around how all aspects of the research was funded and um, potentially down to the level of sources of authors salaries um, so don't be offended if you ask for that information it could be that that uh, particular journal requires it um, in order to to make an ethically uh, considered decision right on to the final section of my presentation um, which will also be the shortest you'll be pleased to hear uh, and this will cover the peer review process so once you've submitted your manuscript, it will enter the peer review cycle and the exact processes involved can differ slightly between journals. But generally speaking, you should expect that an editor and either a staff editor like me or an academic editor will make an initial decision about whether or not to send your paper out for peer review. 
if they think it's unsuitable, it will be rejected at the peer review, uh, sorry, the pre-review stage. If, on the other hand, they're happy for it to go to peer review, then external reviewers will be invited and their comments will be submitted to the handling editor. They will then issue a decision based on the reviewer's reports and their own evaluation, which could either be a rejection, a major or minor revision, or an acceptance. If a revision decision is issued, you'll have a period of time in which to revise the manuscripts and prepare a response to reviewers detailing the changes that you've made to address their concerns. And you'll then resubmit the manuscripts and the editor will either issue or a decision or re-invite reviewers. Now, the point that I really wanted to make here is that throughout the cycle, with which many of you will be very familiar, um, there are multiple points at which an editor will assess your manuscripts. Um, but there are also, beyond the manuscript itself, other important documents such as your response to reviewers and cover letters which need to be prepared with equal care um, as with the manuscript. Um, so do recognise that those um, supporting documents um, are equally important in terms of the way that an editor views and handles your manuscripts. Um, the whole thing comes together as a package. Now, I've just picked out a couple of aspects of the review process that authors sometimes approach in uh, the wrong way um, so that I can uh, perhaps explain how to go about them in the most productive way. So first off, when you submit your manuscript, you'll probably be asked to recommend or exclude potential reviewers. And in doing this, you should suggest people who have the right expertise, thinking carefully, carefully about whether um, you would benefit from having a reviewer with subject area expertise and perhaps another one with expertise for any specific methods that you used. And if you do want to ask for any reviewers to be excluded, for example, because of a conflict of interest that you have with them, make sure that you provide a clear and reasonable explanation for it. What you should not do is to recommend any close associates of yours as reviewers, um, or to exclude all of the people in your field whose opinion on your work you're nervous to hear, um, because that leaves the editor with very few options, um, and again, can delay the processing of your submission. And the other specific scenario that I wanted to briefly mention is appeals. And these happen when your manuscript is rejected by an editor and you want to ask them to reevaluate the decision. It can be very frustrating to have your submission rejected, of course, but you must give yourself time to think carefully um, how you want to respond and not to send a, a knee jerk response while you're still feeling upset about it. So in this situation, what you need to do is discuss the matter with your co-authors and then compile a reasoned, considered response that states your case clearly and calmly. Um, and you should highlight any ways that you think the rejection deviated from the journal's policies or publication criteria, remembering that that's the framework around which the editor should be working. And if you're able to do that, then it's likely the editor will be willing to reconsider their decision in light of the evidence that you're now presenting to them. Okay, so with that, we've actually reached the end of my presentation. Um, I hope that it's provided you with some useful tips and tricks for approaching the publishing process. Um, and uh, giving you an insight into um, the, the life and mindset of a, a journal staff editor. So thank you very much for listening. And um, I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions. I can see that quite a few have been coming in. So um, yeah, thank you again and happy to, to take those now. I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can uh, see each other a bit better. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. Um, now we are in the session of um, open questions. There's one question right here. Why are the fees for open access publications so astronom astronomically high? Um, this is the concern um, of many researchers. Right, yes. Yeah. So I absolutely recognize that the fees are um, high for everybody and especially high for uh, researchers who work in lower resource backgrounds. Um, it can disproportionately affect them and um, completely recognize that. So some of the reasons for um, the, the actual uh, amount which, which publishers require for those fees um, are to do with the operating costs that the publisher has. So for instance, um, PLOS would have to pay somebody like myself, along with all of the other staff at PLOS to, to um, carry out that process and to fund other aspects of our publishing operations. I'll just point out that PLOS is non-profit. So in our particular case, it's not to, to line anybody's pockets, but of course there are also commercial publishers out there um, who are um, specifically trying to, to make a profit. Um, 
unfortunately, in my view. But um, those are a couple of the reasons for um, why those costs exist in the first place. Um, the actual amount will vary between journal because of um, the different costs that they, um, they have in relation to their specific models. Um, I will just go back briefly perhaps to say a little bit more about um, the gradual move that we're seeing away from APCs towards alternative financial models. Um, I, I did briefly mention earlier this global equity model that PLOS has recently launched and which uh, PLOS Climate is using. Um, the way that many of these uh, models work is at the level of the institution rather than the researcher. And what happens is that um, a publisher such as PLOS enters into a partnership with the institutional library um, for a period of, um, I think, three years in the case of our deals. Um, and a, a flat fee is paid by the institution to the publisher, which covers an unlimited number of publications by any researchers affiliated to that institution during that period. Um, and so you can see that um, if, you know, 100 or 200 publications by authors of that institute um, get published in uh, journals involved in that deal with the publisher across those three years, then the per article cost to the institution could end up being very low. It also means that the researcher themselves um, doesn't need to be involved in that process at all. They don't have to worry about finding the money um, or um, negotiating with the journal at all. Um, so PLOS is in the process of um, talking to lots of libraries um, in many countries around the world about setting up these partnerships. We've already signed on lots of them. We have active negotiations with a number of um, institutions right across Latin America. Um, and we should be able to share more details about those soon. I hope that some of you on the call will be affiliated with those institutions. Um, and uh, once those are up and running, you'll have the opportunity to publish in um, those PLOS journals um, at no cost to you as a researcher. Um, and I should say that for anybody who um, is not covered by one of those partnerships, either now or in the future, um, APCs will continue to exist as an alternative. Um, we want it to become a diminishing alternative, you know, that the default becomes these institutional partnerships, but we recognise they won't be possible for everyone in the short term. Um, so APCs will continue to exist, um, but there will also still be um, the full range of waivers and discounts um, for people who are in contexts where they are not able to, to meet the costs of the APC for whatever reason that might be. I hope that answers the, the question. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we have a question here regarding sort of um, types of research when it's um, hard bullock ask if we have an interview data, which means a pool um, and ask if they need to submit the IRB approval document along with the paper submission. This is assume I assume this is sort of uh, ethic. Mm. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. So, and it does, again, vary between journals. Um, those journals which have more stringent ethical checks are likely to ask you to um, uh, confirm that you've received ethical approval. They're not necessarily going to automatically ask for you to um, supply the documentation at the time of submission, but the possibility that they will ask for that documentation at some point during the review process um, does exist and you should be prepared to, to provide that if you are asked for it. Um, so I, I can say that in the case of, of PLOS journals, for instance, and we have quite stringent ethical standards, um, we, we would certainly ask you to um, uh, confirm that, that you have uh, and would be able to supply that documentation. And depending on how the review process goes, we could ask you to, to provide evidence of that. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question on regional, the, the regional aspect of research. It says many regional studies are very important for decisions maker, um, but out of the interest of journal. How can we explain the contribution of these results in a convincing cover letter? Sort of more general, it's like how do you how do you make local examples of, of broad interest? So I think this again relates to um, the, the nature of the journal itself, whether the journal is um, oriented towards addressing. Um, only the kind of most cross-cutting globally relevant issues or if it is a venue that does consider more region, regional specific um, issues and research. Um, and I, I guess I can, I can talk about this from the perspective of a journal like PLOS Climate, which very much has a, a mission that, that bridges the gap between um, global and, and regional science. Um, and I would say that um, 
with a journal such as us, because we have an editorial board that is in itself very global and has representatives in every part of the world and, and who will understand some of the regional nuances and, um, and what's important in uh, the regional context. Um, I think so long as you in your cover letter provide um, uh, an argument which is kind of cogently expressed um, and picks up on the significance in that regional context, then my hope would be that um, if it gets picked up by an editor who is aware of, uh, of that context, um, they will be able to understand why it's important for the journal to consider it and to publish it, even if it's not something which is of direct relevance to other geographical locations. Um, but there will be journals um, who won't be willing to consider that. So yeah. again, it's a consideration when you're thinking about where to send your work in the first place. Thank you, Amy. Um, here we have questions relating to the, the time that it takes to, in average, to publish an article in close climate. So it's a very early days for us to give a definitive answer to that. Um, we opened for submissions at the end of May this year. So we're still only a few months into operations and um, we're rapidly moving towards publishing our first content, but it's not happened just yet. Um, we're looking at early next year. So keep an eye out for that first issue of Post Climate. Um, so I can't, I can't give a, a, an exact number for this, of course, um, but um, what I can say is that right now our average for time to first decision, so the first editorial decision, um, I just got the data on this yesterday, um, is uh, just below 30 days. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment in terms of timing, which is um, quite competitive compared to a lot of other journals in the, the sort of areas that we're working in. Um, obviously, time to publication, we can't really give any answers to that yet because we've not published anything yet. Um, but once that happens, you'll be able to find all of the statistics on our website and information about other plus journals are on their web pages. So you can and repeat um, and repeat your launching is. Scheduled for when we're launching um, early 2022. We can't give a specific date just yet because it depends on you know how the peer review process pans out for the papers that we have at the moment. But it's on course. Okay, I think we are um, on time, Anna. For hi, yes, um, we have you don't know we have until half past the hour, right? Yes, okay. still have Jamie please, with please, us for yeah, all your for questions. Time. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, great. Time. Okay, time. great. Um, is there any question, um, Irene, on the question and answer? I can't. Oh. Yeah, I sent you some questions that were on the Slido, Omar. One was, uh, many Latin, in Latin America have spoken against Plan S, arguing that it threatens its model of open access. Do you have any comments on this? Yes, I'm so I'm very much aware of the concerns over Plan S in Latin America specifically, um, and some of the concerns that have been expressed in the region are ones that are shared by um, people in other parts of the world too. Um, so what I would say about this um, from PLOS's perspective as a publisher is that generally speaking, I think um, we're supportive of the overall aims of Plan S and, and what it's trying to achieve, and we have kind of spoken in, in support of it in different venues. However, we have alongside that recognized the challenges that um, will be faced um, as a consequence of it um, for researchers, for institutions, for libraries um, in different contexts. Um, and our intention as a publisher is to try to um, do what we can to kind of mediate between these um, different visions of open access and understand a bit better what is going to be in the best interests of the various stakeholders involved and try to be a bit more creative in finding solutions that are going to work for everybody because yeah we, we recognize that the, the, the model as it's being proposed um, is not something which is going to be directly compatible with the aspirations and um, and traditions of um, uh, open access in as it exists in um, many parts of, of Latin America, for instance. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to working out how we can reconcile um, these, these ways of working and, and funding open access um, in a way that doesn't uh, detract from anybody's experience or capabilities. So um, yeah, I think PLOS will have more to say about this over the next sort of year or so as, as these things develop. And also as we ourselves um, at PLOS um, try to kind of um, 
extend our regional connections a bit more than we have in the past. What we're we're trying to do um, at PLOS is to um, uh, grow a sort of a bit more of an organic um, presence and, and understanding in some of the regions that we've um, tried to always represent in the past, but where we've not had people on the ground who can kind of mm -hmm. feed into our processes and our um, uh, our knowledge. Um, and we're now kind of in the process of um, setting up some more regional hubs for, for PLOS, um, which will um, again, help us to kind of um, have, have those regional perspectives really woven into our fabric as a publisher. Um, so, Sorry, I can't say much more concrete for now, but um, th this is very much kind of at the forefront of our thinking about the future of, of open science and how we can contribute to that. Thanks, Amy. Um, what about the openness to um, researchers? Is this um, open to seasoned researchers or is it open also to young, um, you know, um, sort of early career researchers that are starting uh, you mean the, the journal itself? Oh. Yes, the the who can submit to to the to the journal? Right. So so yes, we're we're very much open to all comers, and we're specifically interested actually in supporting early career researchers. Um, so we obviously recognise that they are the scientists of, of tomorrow, well today and tomorrow, um, and they're the people who are going to be driving um, the um, the culture of science in future. Um, there are many early career researchers um, are kind of at the crest of the wave in terms of open science in particular, which is obviously central to PLOS's mission. And so we want to understand how we can best support early career researchers. And um, again, we will be implementing um, activities and policies which have been really designed and co-designed with um, early career researchers to, to make sure that they um, are at the core of our community. And so just to give an example of that, over the past couple of months, um, I personally have been meeting with a number of um, regional and subject specific ECR networks um, around the world to um, work out ways with which we can collaborate with them to embed early career researchers um, in the journal's community. Um, and that could include things like um, mentorship with our editorial boards, um, using our social media and blog platforms to um, provide a means of uh, uh, expressing the, the perspectives and experiences of early career researchers to a wider audience, um, and also involving them in the drafting of, of new editorial policies. So we very much see early career researchers being in, integral to the, the future of the journal. Jamie, they want to know your opinion about um, what do you think about the statistics about you know, publishing articles that are um, given by country and sort of this sort of the bibliometrics and that put emphasis on the on the journals and, and not really where the study was made. I think that probably goes in the line with the parachute um, signs that you were talking earlier. Yeah, so, so I guess there are a few different things here. Um, I mean, it's, it's clear that um, there is a, unfortunate um, domination of um, the, the sort of published output in the area of, of climate science in particular. And there have been a number of number of interesting analyses on this have, have come out in the press over the past couple of weeks, really dominated by um, uh, authors and institutions in the global north, in, in North America and in Europe in particular. And um, again, one of the reasons for that, as, as you mentioned just now, Omar, and, and that goes back to, to the um, new policy that we've just launched at PLOS, um, is this phenomenon of, of helicopter or parachute science in which uh, researchers from developed countries um, take themselves off to, to developing countries, carry out the work there without connecting with local partners or involving them in the, the writing up of the research um, or receiving the credit for it when it's published. So there's a lot of uh, cultural change that needs to happen to um, address those sorts of practices, which of course are highly inequitable um, and lead to um, a lack of, of, of credit and benefit to um, uh, the, the countries in which that research is actually taking place and whose resources are um, directly or indirectly being used to, to support that work. Um, so that's what we're really trying to tackle with, with that policy. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the wider issues around the representation of, of different countries in um, uh, climate science publishing, um, I think 
again, it goes back to, to issues of, of, of resource and the way that publishing models are, are set up and, uh, and financial models of, of, of uh, journals. So um, that's something that we're very much trying to tackle through um, um, our adoption of this new global equity model. And I, I can just mention the equity component of that model because I didn't really explain it earlier. Um, I said that it was to do with these institutional partnerships, um, but the equity part of it comes in uh, in the sense that um, Institutions which are based in uh, less economically developed countries will have to pay significantly less to PLOS as a publisher to enter into one of these deals um, compared to institutions in, say, uh, Western Europe or North America. They will pay a lot more. Um, and those institutions in more de economically developed countries um, have the option of topping up their deal um, with an extra amount, which then subsidizes participation um, for institutions in less developed countries even further. Um, so we, we're trying to foster this sense of sort of north-south collaboration there um, by um, you know, providing the opportunity for, for, for that sub subsidy to come into play. Um, obviously, again, as with as with the journal, um, it's early days for the model too, um, but it's been really encouraging to see the positive feedback that we've had from uh, librarians and institutions um, all across the world that we've spoken to about it so far. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we have a, a very interesting uh, question here from Constanza, um, and it's it's about the regional aspect of climate research. It says. Um, if, if PLUS will allow a greater participation of regional perspectives um, in, their, in their acceptance to articles, because many of the concepts and processes could be unique to some areas like the, the South, you know, the South, and then sometimes they're not very well understood um, across. Yes, I think that's that's an excellent point. And um, that's, again, very much something that we're trying to um, consider when we're, we're going about the, the building of the community around the journal, by which I mean the, the composition of the editorial board, ensuring that we have those um, people on the ground in, in all of these different regions who do have that understanding of what really matters, what's relevant in different places, um, so that they can tell us as the kind of um, editorial leads on the journal, um, what we need to be thinking about when we're um, considering or indeed commissioning papers um, so that we have representation of those issues that really matter um, to different regions that we might not might not otherwise come onto our radar. For, you know, when I'm sitting in my office here in Cambridge in, in the UK, I don't know about um, what's going to be of, of relevance in, uh, in Southern South America for instance, instance. and so having um, those editors who do have that knowledge is really crucial. Okay. Um, and the other thing to say is that this, this relates not just to the kind of um, peer-reviewed articles that we publish as a journal, but also the other channels that we're trying to operate. So we've, we've set up a, a new blog called Latitude, which we're sharing with um, the other two new environmental PLOS journals, which are PLOS Water and PLOS Sustainability and Transformation, um, which we're trying to act as a um, a kind of hub for um, sharing perspectives, um, including regional perspectives on lots of different um, issues that um, are of importance to, to different communities um, that might not otherwise kind of find a, a platform for expression. So we're trying to use lots of different approaches to um, raise these things to a wider global audience. Okay, thank you. Um, a quick question here, it's about could the first publication have an impact or influence on subsequent publications in the journal? Is that some, some... I'm not sure I quite understand the, the, well, the question. So. I think you're this right. from the perspective of an early career researcher and they're asking sort of does, where we publish our first paper, how does that affect then our trajectory and where we publish next in the editorial process? Okay, yeah, understood. So um, I, would like to, to say that in at least in an ideal world it, these things are not kind of uh, contingent on one another so if you publish an article in one journal that has no bearing on where you submit your submit your your next work and each submission to an individual journal is also treated editorially independently so you know if you have a history of submitting to a particular journal um, that should not affect any future submissions that you make to that journal assuming that there are you know, no major issues have arisen. Um, so, so I think you you should consider 
the venue that you choose for each item of research that you publish to, to be discrete and, and separate. Um, the only thing might be that um, if you um, have contributed, say, to a, um, a special issue or a collection in a particular journal, and there's the option to continue adding to that same grouping of, of articles in future, um, then that might be a way of, of keeping kind of links between between your papers. But um, otherwise, um, I think it, it really pays to, to think about um, each case, each paper on a case by case basis and, and all of those considerations about who, who the best um, who's going to give you the best um, connection to the audience that you want that paper to reach. Thank you, Jamie. Um, two questions. Um, what would you be a, your advice to early career researchers to have um, greater probabilities to be published in uh, plus um, climate? And how does someone or early career researcher become an academic editor for plus climate? So um, to answer the first question um, about maximizing your, your chances of success in submission, um, I think following many of the, the tips that I shared in my presentation around carefully studying um, the submission guidelines and publication criteria, that that's, it sounds obvious, but it's the, the most important thing that you need to do is just understand what it is that editors are looking for in your paper. Um, because if you can, if you can comply with each of those um, numbered points on the website, um, then you really should, you should be, you know, very close to, to, to making sure that your article will be accepted. Um, making sure that everything is reproducible and that you're in a position to, to share all of the information that the editor is going to request of you. Um, I would just say more generally that um, uh, trying to get as much experience of writing as possible, um, identifying opportunities to take part in, in other workshops, um, finding mentorship opportunities that might exist within your institution for people who, from people who have more um, long-term experience of, of writing papers and um, having their, their work reviewed as well and responding to, to reviewers' comments. Those are all skills that one builds up very gradually over time. And um, unfortunately, there's um, often not kind of dedicated teaching of these skills. Um, and so you have to kind of find um, ad hoc opportunities to, to pick them up as you go along. But um, I think increasingly there is recognition that these are things that institutions need to spend time conveying to, to students and early career researchers as they develop. So I hope that there will be options for you to, um, to find those um, in your, your own places. But um, for the, the second part of the question, um, sorry, remind me of the, the second part. <laughs> it, it was uh, how to, what it takes to become a, an editor for Plus. Oh, of course. Yeah, so joining the editorial board. Excellent. So um, it's um, we're, we're open for, for applications from, from anyone who thinks that they would be a good fit for the board. Um, we have certain criteria that we use to, to vet candidates. Um, and if Laura's still on the call, maybe Laura, you could just give a, a kind of brief overview of the sorts of just the general sorts of things that we look for without going into a huge amount of, of detail necessarily um, uh, when we're, we're um, considering candidates for the editorial board. So I should just introduce uh, my, co my colleague Laura, um, who works on the team within PLOS um, that's involved in um, managing our editorial board and bringing new people onto the board. Um, so hopefully Laura could, could just share some, some brief perspectives on um, opportunities for, for joining PLOS editorial boards. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Sorry, I can't share my video at the moment. But um, so for joining, joining the PLOS editorial boards, um, there is a form that you can fill out on our website um, and I'll link that below in the chat after, after this session. Um, and you can fill out your information there. In general, we ask that people are principal investigators. Um, this, you can sometimes be a bit earlier in your career, but this depends on the journal you're applying to and our areas of need if we need more academic editors in those areas. We also ask that you have a good publication record, and this is usually around 20 publications. Um, and those are our kind of two criteria that are usually the main ones that we look at when people apply for the board. Um, I think for some of our new journals, we, aren't, we don't have um, a link up at the moment for you to apply for those, because we aren't accepting any more applicants at the moment. But for PLOS One, PLOS One is always open for applications. Um, and if you are really interested in the journal, you can email the journal and we can take a look at your application or say whether we're open to receiving that or not. 
Thank you, Laura. Thanks. And just to, just to follow up on that very briefly, um, um, once we have started, you know, publishing more content on, on PLOS Climate next year and for the journal, hopefully begins to, to, to grow further, um, we will likely be expanding our editorial board in the future. We've kind of put together a, a nucleus of editors at the moment who are actively handling the submissions that we're receiving and we've got the right sort of level of capacity, but there will likely be points of time in the future when we'll open up um, more broadly for applications as well. And just again on the, the specific issue of um, early career researchers, and um, opportunities to be involved in editorial activities. Um, we're also exploring whether there might be options for us to, to run um, mentoring schemes um, or things like this to, to provide some um, at least sort of indirect experience of, um, of handling papers um, so that um, you know there's we build up that capacity and understanding of, of how the processes work among um, younger pool of, of researchers. Thank you, Jamie. I'll just jump in there, Jamie, that we have okay. discussed potentially co-hosting a future seminar about that topic also to provide more insights into the review process and what an academic editor does. So that's something that we hope to bring to this community in the future. Great, great. Jamie, one, one, another question, um, and it's related to the, what you mentioned on the blog. Could you expand a little bit on that? Because that might be a good um, media for, for um, voicing um, perspectives on climate. Yep, sorry, I was just uh, grabbing the link to the blog so I can share it in the chat, um, which I'll do in a second. Um, there we go. So the blog, again, is called Latitude. And um, yeah, the idea here was to um, uh, provide a forum that we can where we can share some really diverse perspectives, both from um, people who are directly involved in the journal community. So that includes um, editors and um, authors and, and other contributors to the journal, um, but also external um, parties um, whose opinions we want to solicit and understand on um, issues that are either relevant to the research that they're carrying out um, or to issues that are in the news. Um, so obviously at the moment, um, we're building up to, to the climate negotiations in Glasgow in a few weeks time and we'll have some a series of, of blog posts around that from different perspectives um but but we really want to um uh yeah use this this space on the blog as somewhere where we can um, represent views from different career stages different geographies um different experiences in the world of, of science and, and publishing um and to to kind of um convey those to to the very broad audience and all of the blog posts are going to be shared through our social media channels to kind of maximize their reach as well so if ever anybody is is interested in uh, potentially contributing something to the blog um, then you can both find some guidelines for writing items for the blog on the blog website itself um, and you can also contact me um, or uh, any of the other um, editors on the the other plus journals involved in the blog um, to, to discuss those ideas for Further, but we're very much um, open to, to contributions and, and happy to discuss any any ideas from anybody on the call. So. Thank you. Anna, you want to mention about something, the, the recent blog plus that EIE posted on Latitude? I'll turn the floor to Irene because she's really been leading our efforts at IEI to branch out into different ways to communicate science and policy to the community. And we had the opportunity to work with PLOS on that piece. Yes. Thanks to Jamie, we got enthused enough to write a piece uh, reporting actually on the latest conference of the parties at the II, which uh, collected in only a few words the work that, that we've been doing and the plans for the future. And uh, it is indeed, the blog is a, it's a great opportunity to report quickly on uh, any findings, an event, uh, a, a meeting, a, an important topic, including, for example, a brief account of what's happening, what's hot in the Caribbean region, for example. I just read a, a recent piece on that. So it is, it is important also that um, scientists engage in science communication and the blog is, is, is a good outlet for that. So I encourage, especially um, early career researchers that are still working on their papers and it's still difficult to write a full scientific report, even if short, to write a blog uh, discussing and, and, and proposing or maybe even being critical about an issue that's important in, in science. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Anna. Um, one other question before 
it, it, it's hiding from the chat. It's about the double-blinded peer review process, Jamie, and, and his, um, Frederic is curious about how PLOS um, opinion on double-blinded. Yeah, so um, for, for, for kind of clarity for everybody, um, there are various models of, of peer review um, in terms of um, whose identity is, is revealed to who during the review process. And um, so double, bl bl double blind, sorry, get my words right. Double blind peer review um, involves um, anonymity for um, both the reviewers and for the authors. Um, so that um, the, the idea in that model is that um, you re reduce the um, opportunity for any uh, biases to, to emerge um, through the, the uh, sharing of the author's identity. Um, this is not something which has been implemented on POS journals, um, which generally have operated um, single blind peer review, um, where the reviewer's identities, unless they choose to disclose them, are withheld. Um, and that's because we actually have tended to, to move in the other direction towards more openness, um, so as of, I think it's a couple of years ago now, we have offered um, as an option um, authors to, to choose for their article to be subjected to open peer review, um, which means that the identities of, of all parties involved, including the reviewers, um, are made public um, at the time that the, the article is published. So um, everybody is kind of... Uh, held to, to that um, higher level of accountability through that additional degree of transparency, um, which we see as, as one advantage of, of, of open peer review. Um, there's, again, lots of information available on our websites and, and various post blog posts about um, what we see as being the, the benefits of, of um, open or transparent peer review. Um, but again, I would emphasize that it's something that um, we have implemented as an option rather than as a, a compulsory aspect of the review process. Um, but we have seen a good level of, of uptake um, and a lot of kind of positive response in um, our author communities across the PLOS journals that, that use that model. Thank you. Um, I have a question myself. Um, Jamie, do you mention um, what type of papers, articles will be uh, PLOS Climate be receiving? Yeah, I didn't say earlier, but um, what we are currently set up to consider is mostly uh, primary research articles. Um, standard articles. Um, on top of that, we are, um, myself and the editor-in-chief, we're actively commissioning um, opinions and reviews, um, which will be the, the front matter content for the journal. Um, and uh, in the longer term, once we've kind of got through this very busy uh, initial phase of, of launching the journal, um, we hope that we will then be able to um, offer uh, various other article types alongside research articles. Um, I can't promise anything right now, of course, but, but that could, for example, include some of the article types that um, are currently available on PLOS One, which include um, a number of types of protocol articles and uh, registered reports. Um, which are a type of pre-registration of, of studies. Um, so they may become and hopefully will become available on PLOS Climate in the future. Um, but for now, we're focusing on uh, standard research articles. Um, and I should just say that that does include meta-research, so systematic reviews and meta-analyses okay. are in scope for PLOS Climate. Um, and uh, we also consider negative results and replication studies if they include a, a clear scientific mm. justification. Thank you. Will, will PLOS Climate in consider um, reply to, to papers and articles published in the journal in case somebody have a different um, opinion? Um, so we do have an article type called, which are referred to as formal comments um, on PLOS journals, um, which will be um, available at some point on PLOS Climate. We've not yet kind of um, thought too, too deeply about that because we haven't yet published any, any research articles, but um, I'm sure that that option will be available on PLOS Climate later on. Um, those are considered by staff editors on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other question. Irene, you see anything on the... No, not in the Q&A and not in the chat. Uh, I guess it's time to wrap up. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, time is up. And um, thank you, Jamie, Laura, 
um, and everybody else for attending this um, webinar. And um, we from uh, EIE um, will be certainly um, making this type of webinar possible for you. And we invite you to be um, in touch and we invite you to future events that we will be organizing. And thank you to PLOS Climate and to Jamie again for uh, sharing all your knowledge and perspectives on the editorial process of PLOS Climate. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Omar. Thanks uh, to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Yo. Bye bye. I'll I'll end the meeting now. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie, again. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Lucia, so much. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to the mm -hmm. interpreters. Many thanks. Adriana, Gracias. 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 Thank you, Jamie. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for organizing everything and all the logistics. <laughs>